Section 11 of The Carved Lions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Bodorf. The Carved Lions by Mary Louisa Molesworth. Chapter 11 Kind Friends. It was Miss Finmore. I knew her again at once, and she called me my poor little girl the very word she had used when she said good-bye to me and looked so sorry before she went away for the easter holidays never to come back though she did not then know it to green bank you remember me dear she said in the sweet tones i had loved to hear don't speak if you feel too ill or if it tires you but don't feel frightened or unhappy though you are in a strange place everything will be right i felt soothed almost at once but my curiosity grew greater. When did you come? I said. You weren't here when I woke before. It was someone with a cap. First I thought it was one of the lions. The sound of my own voice surprised me. It was so feeble and husky, and though my throat did not hurt me much, I felt that it was thick and swollen. Miss Finmore thought I was still only half awake or light-headed, but she was too sensible to show that she thought so. One of the lions, she said, smiling. You mean the carved lions that Myra is so fond of? No, that was a very funny fancy of yours. A lion with the cap on. It was old Hannah that you saw, the old nurse. She has been watching beside you all night. When you woke before, I was out. I went out very early. She spoke in a very matter-of-fact way, but rather slowly, as if she wanted to be sure of my understanding what she said and as my mind cleared and i followed her words i grew more and more anxious to know all there was to hear i don't understand i said and it hurts me to speak is this your house miss finmore and how do you know about the lions and who brought me in here and why didn't i know when i was put in this bed miss finmore looked at me rather anxiously when i said it hurt me to speak but she seemed pleased too at my asking the question so distinctly don't speak dear she said quietly and i will explain it all the doctor said you were not to speak if it hurt you the doctor i repeated another puzzle yes said miss finmore the doctor who lives in this street dr fallis he knows you quite well and you know him don't you just nod your head a little instead of speaking but the doctor's name brought back too many thoughts for me to be content with only nodding my head dr fallis i said oh i would so like to see him he could tell me but i stopped mrs selwood's address i was going to say as all the memories of the day before began to rush over me why didn't i know when he came you were asleep dear but he is coming again said miss finmore quietly he was afraid you had caught a sore throat by the way you breathed you must have caught cold in the evening down in the show-room by the lions before they found you and then she went on to explain it all to me i was in mr cranston's house up above the big show-rooms where he and old mrs cranston lived they had found me fast asleep leaning against one of the lions the old porter and the boy who went round late in the evening to see that all was right for the night though when the rooms were shut up earlier no one had noticed me i was so fast asleep so utterly exhausted that i had not awakened when the old man carried me up to the kitchen just as the servants were about going to bed to ask what in the world was to be done with me nor even later when on miss finmore's recognizing me they had undressed and settled me for the night in the comfortable old-fashioned best bedroom had i opened my eyes or spoken old hannah watched beside me all night and quite early in the morning dr fallis who fortunately was the cranston's doctor too had been sent for he said we were to let you have your sleep out said miss finmore though by your breathing he was afraid you had caught cold how is your throat now dear it doesn't hurt very much i said only it feels very shut up i expect you will have to stay in bed all to-day she replied dr fallis will be coming soon and then we shall know but but i began then as the thought of it all came over me still more distinctly i hid my face in the pillow and burst into tears must i go back to school i said oh miss fenmore they will be so angry i came away without leave because because i couldn't bear it and they said i told what wasn't true that was almost the worst of all fancy if they wrote and told mamma that i told lies she would not believe it said miss finmore quietly 
and besides i don't think miss ledbury would do such a thing and she always writes to the parents herself i know she is kind and good geraldine perhaps she means to be i said among my tears but it's miss aspinwall and and miss broom i think i hate her miss fenmore oh i shouldn't say that i never used to hate anybody i'm getting all wrong and naughty i know and i burst into fresh sobs poor miss fenmore looked much distressed no doubt she had been told to keep me quiet and not let me excite myself geraldine dear she said do try to be calm if you could tell me all about it quietly the speaking would do you less harm than crying so try dear you need not speak loud i swallowed down my tears and began the story of my troubles once i started i could not have helped telling her all even if it had hurt my throat much more than it did and she knew a good deal already she was a girl of great natural quickness and full of sympathy she seemed to understand what i had been going through far better than i could put it in words and when at last tired out i left off speaking she said all she could to comfort me there was no need for me to trouble about going to green bank just now dr fallis had said i must stay where i was for the present and when i saw him i might tell him everything i liked he will understand she said and he will explain to miss ledbury i have seen miss ledbury this morning already and was she dreadfully angry i interrupted no dear miss finmore replied she has been terribly frightened about you and miss aspinwall and some of the servants have been rushing about everywhere but miss ledbury is very good as i keep telling you geraldine she is very sorry to hear how unhappy you have been and if she had known how anxious you were about your father and mother she would have tried to comfort you i wish you had told her i wanted to tell her but miss broom was there and they thought i told stories i repeated well never mind about that now you shall ask dr fallis and i am sure that he will tell you you need not be so unhappy it was not long afterwards that i knew how very distressed poor old miss ledbury had been and how she had blamed herself for not having tried harder to gain my confidence nor did i fully understand at the time how very sensible miss finmore had behaved when mr and mrs cranston sent her off to greenbank to tell of my having without intending it taken refuge with them she had explained things so that miss ledbury and indeed miss aspinwall felt far more sorry for me than angry with me just as miss finmore mentioned his name there came a tap at the door and in another moment i saw the kind well-known face of our old doctor looking in well well he began looking at me with a rather odd smile and how is the little runaway my dear child why did you not come to me instead of wandering all about great mexington streets in the dark and the rain not that you could have found anywhere better for yourself than this kind house but you might have been all night downstairs in the cold tell me what made you run away like that no don't tell me just yet it's all right now but i think you have talked enough has she had anything to eat and he turned to miss finmore then he looked at my throat and listened to my breathing and tapped me and felt my pulse and looked at my tongue before i could speak at all she must stay in bed all to-day he said at last i will see her again this evening and he went on to give miss finmore a few directions about me i fidgeting all the time to ask him about father and mamma though feeling too shy to do so geraldine is very anxious to tell you one of the chief causes of her coming away from greenbank as she did said miss finmore and then she spoke of the gossip that had reached me through harriet smith about the terribly unhealthy climate my parents were in dr fallis listened attentively i wanted to write to mrs selwood and i thought mr cranston would tell me her address i said though i almost started when i heard how hoarse and husky my voice sounded can you tell it me i do so want to write to her mrs selwood is abroad my dear and not returning till next month said dr fallis but when he saw how my face fell he added quickly but i think i can tell you perhaps better than she about your parents i know the place mr lamarchant consulted me about it before he decided on going as he knew i had been there myself in my young days unhealthy no not if people take proper care your father and mother live in the best part on high ground out of the town there is never any fever there and i had a most cheerful letter from your father quite lately put all these fears out of your head my poor child please god you will have papa and mamma safe home again before long but they must not find such a poor little white shrimp of a daughter when they come you must get strong and well and do all that this kind young lady tells you to do good-bye good-bye and he hurried off 
I was crying again by this time, but quietly now, and my tears were not altogether because I was weak and ill. They were in great measure tears of relief. I was so thankful to hear what he said about father and mamma. Miss Finmore, I whispered, I wonder why they didn't take me with them, if it's such a nice place. And there wouldn't have been all these dreadful things. It's a quite different matter to take a child to a hot climate, she said. Grown-up people can stand much that would be very bad for girls and boys. When I was little, my father was in India, and my sister and I had to be brought up by an aunt in England. Did you mind? I said eagerly. And did your papa soon come home? And where was your mamma? Miss Finmore smiled, but there was something a little sad in her smile. I was very happy with my aunt, she said. She was like a mother to me, for my mother died when I was a little baby. Yes, my father has been home several times, but he is in India again now, and he won't be able to come back for good till he is quite old. So you have much happier things to look forward to, you see, Geraldine? That was true. I felt very sorry for Miss Finmore as I lay thinking over what she had been telling me. Then another idea struck me. Is Mrs. Cranston your aunt? I said. Is that why you are living here? Miss Finmore looked up quickly. No, she replied. I thought somehow that you understood. I am here because I am Myra Rabbi's governess. Myra Rabbi, who used to come for some lessons to Greenbank. Oh, I exclaimed. This explained several things. Oh, yes, I went on. I remember her. And I know she's Mr. Cranston's granddaughter. He was speaking to her of Mama one day. I should like to see her, Miss Fenmore. May I? Miss Fenmore was just going to reply when again there came a tap at the door, and in answer to her, come in it opened and two figures appeared i could see them from where i lay and i shall never forget the pretty picture they made myra i knew by sight and as i think i have said before she was an unusually lovely child and with her was a quite old lady a small old lady myra was nearly as tall as she with a face that even i though children seldom notice beauty in elderly people saw was quite charming this was mrs cranston I felt quite surprised. Mr. Cranston was a rather stout old man, with spectacles and a big nose. I had not thought him at all pretty, and somehow I had fancied Mrs. Cranston must be something like him, and I gave a sigh of pleasure as the old lady came up to the side of the bed with a gentle smile on her face. Dr. Fallis gave us leave to come in to see you, my dear, she said. Myra has been longing to do so all the morning. I've been waiting to see her, too, I said half shyly. And please... It's very kind of you to let me stay here in this nice room. I didn't mean to fall asleep downstairs. I only wanted to speak to Mr. Cranston. I'm sure Mr. Cranston would be very pleased to tell you anything he can that you want to know, my dear. But I think you mustn't trouble just now about anything except getting quite well, said the old lady. Myra has been wanting to come to see you all the morning, but we were afraid of tiring you. Myra came forward gently, her sweet face looking rather grave. I put out my hand, and she smiled. May she stay with me a little? I asked Mrs. Cranston. Of course she may. That's what she came for, said the grandmother heartily. But I don't think you should talk much. Missy's voice sounds as if it hurt her to speak, she went on, turning to Miss Finmore. It doesn't hurt me much, I said. I dare say I shall be quite well tomorrow. I am so glad I'm here. I wouldn't have liked to be ill at school, and I gave a little shudder. I'm quite happy now that Dr. Fallis says it's not true about father and mamma getting ill at that place, and I don't want to ask Mr. Cranston anything now, thank you. It was about Mrs. Selwood, but I don't mind now. I had been sitting up a little. Now I laid my head down on the pillow again with a little sigh, half of weariness, half of relief. Mrs. Cranston looked at me rather anxiously. Are you very tired, my dear? she said. Perhaps it would be better for Myra not to stay just now. Oh, please let her stay, I said. I like to see her. So Myra sat down beside my bed and took hold of my hand. And though we did not speak to each other, I liked the feeling of her being there. Mrs. Cranston left the room then, and Miss Finmore followed her. I think the old lady had made her a little sign to do so, though I did not see it. Afterwards I found out that Mrs. Cranston had thought me looking very ill, worse than she had expected, and she wanted to hear from Miss Finmore if it was natural to me to look so pale. I myself, though feeling tired and disinclined to talk, was really happier than I had been for a very long time. There was a delightful sensation of being safe and at home, 
even though the kind people who had taken me in like a poor little stray bird were strangers the very look of the old-fashioned room and the comfortable great big four-post bed made me hug myself when i thought how different it was from the bare cold room at greenbank where there had never once been a fire in all the weeks i was there it reminded me of something what was it oh yes in a minute or two i remembered it was the room i had once slept in with mamma at grandmamma's in london several years before when i was quite a little girl for dear grandmamma had died soon after we came to live at great mexington but there was the same comfortable old-fashioned feeling red curtains to the window and the bed and a big fire and the shiny dark mahogany furniture oh yes how well i remember it and how enormous the bed seemed and how mamma tucked me in at night and left the door a little open in case i should feel lonely before she came to bed it all came back to me so that i forgot where i was for the moment till i felt a little tug given to the hand that myra was still holding and heard her voice say very softly are you going to sleep geraldine this brought me back to the present oh no i said i'm not sleepy i was only thinking and i told her what had come into my mind she listened with great interest how unhappy you must have been when your mamma went away she said i can't remember my own mamma but mother she meant her stepmother is so kind and granny is so sweet i've never been lonely you can't fancy what it's like i said it wasn't only mamma's going away i know hattie that's my brother loves her as much as i do but he's not very unhappy because he likes his school oh myra what shall i do when i have to go back to school i'd rather be ill always do you think i'll have to go back tomorrow? myra looked most sympathizing and concerned i don't think you'll be quite well tomorrow. was the best comfort she could give me when i have bad colds and sore throats they always last longer than one day i'd like to talk a great lot to keep my throat from getting quite well i said but i suppose that would be very naughty yes said myra with conviction i'm sure it would be you really mustn't talk geraldine granny said so mightn't i read aloud to you i've brought a book with me it's an old story-book of mamma's that she had when she was a little girl granny keeps them here altogether this one is called ornaments discovered thank you i said i should like it very much and in her gentle little voice myra read the quaint old story aloud to me it was old-fashioned even then for the book had belonged to her mother if not in the first place to her grandmother how very old world it would seem to the children of today i wonder if any of you know it for i am growing quite an old woman myself and the little history of my childhood that i am telling you will before long be half a century in age though its events seem as clear and distinct to me as if they had only happened quite recently i came across the little red gilt leaf book not long ago in the house of one of myra's daughters and with the sight of it a whole flood of memories rushed over me it was not a very exciting story but i found it very interesting and now and then my little friend stopped to talk about it which i found very interesting too i was quite sorry when miss finmore who had come back to the room and was sitting very quietly sewing told myra that she thought she had read enough and that it must be near dinner time i will come again after dinner said myra and then i whispered something to her she nodded she quite understood me what i said was this i wish you would go downstairs and tell the carved lions that they made me very happy last night and i am so glad that they brought me back here to you instead of taking me to green bank where did they take you in the night said myra with great interest though not at all as if she thought i was talking nonsense i'll tell you all about it afterwards i said it was beautiful but it would take a long time to tell and i'm rather tired you're looking tired dear said miss finmore who heard my last words as she gave me a cup full of beef tea try to go to sleep for a while and then myra can come in to sit with you again i did go to sleep but myra was not allowed to see me again that day nor the next nor for several days after except for a very few minutes at a time for i did not improve as the kind people about me had hoped i would and dr fallis looked graver when he came that evening than he had done in the morning miss finmore was afraid she had let me talk too much but after all i do not think anything would have made any great difference i had really been falling out of health for months past 
and I should probably have got ill in some other way if I had not caught cold in my wanderings. I did not very clearly remember those days of serious illness. I knew whenever I was awake that I was being tenderly cared for, and in the half-dozing, half-dreaming state in which many hours must have passed, I fancied more than once that Mama was beside me, which made me very happy. And though never actually delirious, I had very strange though not unpleasant dreams, especially about the carved lions. None of them, however, so clear and real as the one I related at full in the last chapter. On the whole, that illness left more peaceful and sweet memories than memories of pain. Through it all I had the delightful feeling of being cared for and protected, and somehow it all seemed to have to do with the pair of lions downstairs in Mr. Cranston's showroom. End of section 11 Kind Friends